Hello everyone. I'm excited to present our work, Augmentations in Graph Contrastive Learning, Current Methodological Flaws and Towards Better Practices. This work was done with my collaborators, Igdeep, Eugen, Yaoching, and Denai. Contrastive learning is a popular self-supervised representation learning paradigm for both images and graphs. Here, representations are learned by enforcing similarity between augmented views of a sample or positive pairs and enforcing dissimilarity between negative samples, which are typically just other samples in the batch. Normalized temperature cross entropy is a commonly used contrastive loss that effectively enforces the desired similarity and dissimilarity. Contrastive learning can be used for graph representation learning by using GNN-based encoders and graph augmentations. You et al. propose domain agnostic graph augmentations as a set of first pass flexible augmentations that work on arbitrary graph data sets. These augmentations include masking node attributes, perturbing edges, dropping nodes, and sampling subgraphs. While more sophisticated augmentation strategies have been proposed recently, daggers remain a popular strategy in what we study in this work. Notably, VCL has achieved considerable success in visual representation learning and can even suppress the performance of supervised models on various vision tasks. This has led to a spur of research into the properties that make VCL successful. Our paper is motivated by such works that seek to understand these properties of VCL success, and we conduct an analysis into how GCL deviates from these principles of VCL. We then propose better practices based on our analysis. And finally, we incorporate these better practices uh, into two case studies that also adhere to the benefits of um, or the successful principles of VCL. We begin by discussing the properties and principles found to be important to the success of VCL. First, augmentation should be diverse to prevent representation collapse, and this is satisfied by both VCL and graph CL augmentation strategies. Next, augmentation should preserve semantic information to enforce similarity meaningfully. However, it's unclear if DAGAs are able to accomplish this due to the unclear relationship between a graph's features and structures and its semantics or label. Next, training should induce task relevant invariances that will then improve downstream task performance. To the best of our knowledge, this study into variants hasn't been uh, well investigated with DAGAs. And fourth, data sets should provide sufficient negative samples to ensure stable training. The large size of many image data sets ensures this is true for, for visual contrastive learning, but it's unclear if this is true for GraphSeal, where data sets are also often quite small. Now, furthermore, these principles can be straightforwardly related back to the contrastive loss. We begin by looking at the deviations between visual CL and graph CL. Now, recall that data augmentation should preserve semantic information. Otherwise, if this information is destroyed, contrastive learning will maximize similarity between semantically dissimilar samples, which will then harm representation quality and hurt downstream task performance. For example, DAGAs can create the following molecules as a positive pair, but it is going to be incorrect to enforce similarity between them as they have different properties due to their pH, one molecule being basic and the other acidic. While the relationship between the structure and the semantics is known here due to our knowledge of chemistry, on many graph data sets, such as social networks, this relationship is not going to be well known. Therefore, we instead try to estimate if task relevant information is being destroyed by looking at the shift between augmented and clean distributions, instead of looking at individual samples. So here we report the clean accuracy and augmented accuracy of a supervised model on various graph classification benchmarks. While it is expected there's going to be some loss in accuracy when working with augmented samples, a significant drop, for example, in the case of mutag, suggests that task relevant information may have indeed been destroyed. Meanwhile, in the case of gossip cop, where aug the augmented distributions accuracy and the clean distributions accuracy are quite similar and also quite high, it's likely that augmentations are preserving that task relevant information. Now, failure, of course, to preserve the task relevant information, as mentioned, can lead to training on false positive pairs, which then harms representation quality. So this is what we look at next, the representation quality of, of our GCL frameworks. So let's look at the implication of training on false positive samples by looking at the discriminability of these representations. 
Now, recall that contrastive learning improves task performance by simultaneously inducing invariance to irrelevant information and also minimizing similarity to negative samples. Therefore, we expect that intraclass similarity should increase and interclass similarity should decrease over the course of training. So if you were to visualize all pair similarity on the right, uh, sorted by class uh, ID, we would expect that intraclass similarity is that light peach color and it's high, while interclass similarity is that purple color and it's lower. However, in limitation one, we saw that DAGAs may induce invariance amongst semantically dissimilar samples or false positive pairs. So here we ask if this does manifest in the discriminability of representations. So as a reminder, we have our visualization of the expected result, high intraclass similarity and low intraclass similarity. So those off diagonal intraclass blocks. So GraphCL, which uses DAGAs, has low class A intraclass similarity, uh, indicated by that upper left-hand block. And this may be due to training on semantically dissimilar pairs. Meanwhile, MVGRL, another method for SSL, uh, uses diffusion operators to create views and has high intraclass similarity as desired and also low interclass similarity as desired. Infograph, another method which directly maximizes mutual information between global and local views, has high intraclass similarity, but also relatively higher interclass similarity as well. Lastly, we note that an untrained model also appears to have some level of similarity built into it, though the interclass similarity it remains pretty high in this case. Next, we investigate the role of inductive bias of GCL in more detail. Despite the previously discussed limitations, GCL appears to do well across several data sets. We find that one factor that may be bolstering its performance despite the limitations we saw is the inductive bias of untrained models. Indeed, on several data sets, we find that randomly initialized models perform comparably to GCL, suggesting that this may be a hidden mechanism that may be helping out GCL performance. In the appendix, we look at various different architectures as well to see how this manifests. Having looked at some limitations, we now look at some better practices in regards to the limitations we have seen. We suggest that practitioners use distributional metrics to understand how augmentations are altering the sample distribution, given that they may not preserve task relevant information. Next, we suggest that practitioners perform a holistic evaluation that goes beyond just linear evaluation accuracy, such as inspecting the similarity between classes or samples, as DAGAs can induce weakly discriminable representations, as we saw. Further, we suggest that uh, randomly initialized models are reported as baselines, as the inductive bias of GNNs can be quite strong, and it becomes hard to justify the cost of unsupervised learning if randomly initialized models are already performing quite well. Furthermore, we know some problems with evaluation as well. So while graph benchmarks are known to be problematic due to their small size, we note that this is particularly problematic in the context of graph contrastive learning. Specifically, small batch sizes can lead to poor training stability, which can harm our ability to learn good representations. Furthermore, in any given batch, 50% of the negative samples are expected to be false positives because this is a binary task. We suggest that in such situations, it's actually better to use negative sample free frameworks for these data sets, for example, BYOL or SimSIM. Having looked at these limitations and better practices, we now look at two case studies that allow us to adhere to these principles and see their benefits. So our previous discussion of limitations has found that DAGAs often do not satisfy the principles that we wish that they would on many data sets. Therefore, we use content-aware augmentations, which will satisfy these principles by design to demonstrate their beneficial effects. We use two intuitive data modalities, natural language and images, to leverage domain knowledge to then create content-aware augmentations. Here we'll focus in detail on the natural language modality, but please see our paper for additional details about the image case study. Our first case study is a document classification task using co-occurrence graph. Co-occurrence graphs have been used to effectively model uh, documents as they can capture long-range dependencies. These graphs are created as follows. Words correspond to nodes, word-to-vec embeddings to node features, and edges 
are defined as co-occurrence within a sliding window. Our task here is to use is to classify documents using these co-occurrence graphs as subjective or objective. For this task, we're going to define content-aware augmentations by perturbing the original sentence prior to graphs construction. Specifically, we use the easy data augmentations proposed by Wei at U, which include synonym replacement, random insertion, deletion, and swapping. By doing so, we know that task-relevant information is preserved after the construction process, and indeed, we're going to be inducing some task-relevant invariances given our knowledge of how these easy data augmentations affect natural language sentences. This is in contrast to domain agnostic graph augmentations, such as node dropping, which can alter the co-occurrence graph structure, but now it becomes unclear if this altered co-occurrence graph is still able to capture the semantics that were represented in the original sample's co-occurrence graph. Given our two augmentation strategies, we now perform our evaluation. First, we note that our content-aware augmentation is going to satisfy the principles that we know to be important to the success of um, contrastive learning, producing diverse augmentations, preserving semantics, and inducing task-relevant information. Furthermore, because this is a binary task, we're going to use positive sample-only frameworks, SimSIM, and BOL, BYOL. We use the Message Passing Attention Network, a GNN architecture designed for working with co-occurrence graphs as our encoder. We find that across two different window sizes and several different convolutional layers, that content-aware augmentations substantially improve performance over domain agnostic augmentations. Our case study demonstrates that using domain knowledge in an abstracted modality, natural language in this case, can be used to design content-aware augmentations. Given that graphs are often used to represent structured data from different modalities, this simple strategy may be quite helpful to practitioners in designing strong augmentations. Our second case study focuses on superpixel classification, which has precedence as a GNN benchmark. Specifically, this task takes MNIST images, converts them into superpixels using SLIC, and then creates a KNN graph where we will then perform classification amongst those graphs. This has precedence as a benchmark in GNNs and is also appropriate for the evaluation of negative sample frameworks due to multiple classes and relatively larger data set size. Here, we take an alternative strategy in defining a content-aware augmentation. We intentionally induce irrelevant information that does not harm semantic information, in this case, color, which doesn't affect our ability to classify MNIST digits. This leads to changes in the node features of our downstream graph. This is in contrast to domain agnostic graph augmentations, such as node dropping, which may alter the resulting canon superpixel graph such that it has it may not be able to capture the original semantics of the original uh, sample. We find that coloring or content-aware augmentation is indeed in fact effective at improving performance. This suggests that learning invariance to introduce irrelevant information may be a valuable strategy for designing content-aware augmentations and inducing useful invariances. In conclusion, we've looked at the deviations between visual contrastive learning and graph contrastive learning and discussed the implications of not adhering to the principles found to be useful to contrastive learning. We then proposed some simple practices in light of the limitations we saw. These include using distributional metrics to understand how augmentations are preserving task relevant information, using holistic evaluation to understand representation quality and discriminability, reporting randomly initialized models as baseline, and using native sample free frameworks when we're using small binary data sets. Furthermore, we conducted two case studies that demonstrate the benefits of adhering to successful contrastive learning principles and offered two simple strategies that practitioners may use to design content-aware augmentations that adhere to the principles of successful CL. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and thank you to my collaborators as well. Please email me with any questions that you may have about this talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, PJ. That was very interesting. Uh, does anyone have, uh, are there any questions in the audience for Pooja? Okay, if, if not, I, uh, I have uh, at least one question. Um, so the, um, 
the reasons uh, for this study, the, the problems you've identified um, with contrastive learning here are extremely compelling to me. It's um, very interesting distinctions between um, the vision field and, and the graph field. Um, I um, was a little bit, um, I, I haven't seen re really examples of those case studies um, in as like real tasks, uh, both, both can uh, use relatively simple graphs. So in the text case, you're looking at um, words that are close to each node. The, the graph is formed essentially from the KNN linear graph through the text. Also um, in the handwriting case, again, you have the KNN graph between the pixels. So these are relatively um, simple graphs in their structure. And I'm wondering if you can offer any comments about future work for techniques um, on more complicated graphs, like for chemicals. And, and the reason I ask is because the, the original problem you pointed out with the, the chemical application is very compelling. If you flip an edge or remove a node from a molecule, it's, it's a different molecule. And we don't know if that molecule is gonna have the same property as the original molecule enough to make it a positive example. Um, so that seems like very, still very difficult to do outside of these two simpler case studies. So I wonder if that resonates with you at all, Pooja, and if you could offer any comments. Yeah, um, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I think that sort of extending this work to, to molecules is definitely a great next step. I guess the reason why we didn't include it here is sort of the domain knowledge that, as you alluded to, that you would need to do augmentations effectively for molecules would be um, a bit more substantial, right? You would actually <laughs> have to have some pretty in-depth knowledge of chemistry, which unfortunately I'm a bit lacking on. But I think Same. that, yeah. But I think that perhaps encoding things as like what constitutes a valid molecule, like valence, um, if the valence in an augmented molecule is, is valid or is not, maybe a way to check the validity of the augmentations you create before then passing them on to, um, the, the contrastive learning framework. I think that another thing that might be interest is perhaps the use of generative models where you can perform augmentations in a generative space to perform, to, to identify new types of augmentations, but uh, definitely an interesting line to, to continue with. Um, was awesome. that? Yes, makes okay. sense. Any other questions for Pooja before we move on?